please be seated. Welcome, parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, nieces, nephews, extended family members, and friends. We're glad you are with us today to honor our graduating seniors. But actually, these are not our seniors. They came in earlier this morning, grabbed their diplomas, and are headed to the beach. <laughs> Thanks to Central Casting, they've sent over a wonderful group of students to take their places. Just kidding. As we begin, let's all just settle in and join together in silent reflection as we express our gratitude for everyone who has worked so hard to make this day possible. Our spouses and partners, friends and relatives, teachers, leaders, counselors, and of course, the students themselves. And not to be forgotten, Today is the 75th anniversary of the invasion of Normandy, D-Day. Let's give a special silent thanks to those in our armed forces, without whom we would not be enjoying the many benefits and freedoms that this day brings. Well, we have with us a very special group of people who have worked very hard over the past year in support of Greensboro Day School, and I'd like to ask them to stand and be recognized at this time, our Board of Trustees. <clears throat> well. As we all learned at convocation yesterday, this is a rather special class. They've proven themselves academically to be in the top tier of all high school graduates from across the country as national merit finalists, semi-finalists. They have received regional, statewide, and national recognition for their talent as actors, musicians, photographers, and artists. And in the most challenging, college admission years, over 80% of them had, eight, had multiple college acceptances. 14 will be playing sports at the collegiate level, baseball, basketball, lacrosse, rowing, soccer, and tennis. And as a class, they have earned over $4.7 million in merit scholarships. They've taken time from their busy lives over the course of their time at Greensboro Day School to provide leadership in the greater Greensboro community through participation in citywide councils. They have organized and led community service projects throughout the school and the city. They have recycled trash, tutored, traveled, experienced life in Europe, the Caribbean, Australia, India, Africa, South Africa, Nicaragua, and have served and led the Honor and Disciplinary Councils and the Student Council, participated in clubs, organized activities that have enriched our school. They have sung in our choirs. They have danced and acted on our stages, played in our bands and orchestras, demonstrated their artistic talents, played on multiple sports teams, and most importantly, they have grown in character and stature as they experience the many exceptional extracurricular opportunities that GDS has provided them. And in addition to demonstrating their athletic talent, they have also been recognized for their sportsmanship on the fields and the courts on which they played. As a class, they've survived the challenges of hiking, cooking, and sleeping on the ground for a week in the wilderness of the Pisgah National Forest. They have warmly greeted visitors to our campus and provided a wonderful sense of community across our campus and in each division. Seniors, your teachers have provided you the intellectual, ethical, and interpersonal foundations that you need to become constructive contributors to the world. And as is obvious, you've already begun 
down that path. You have worked hard, learned, grown socially and academically. You have been tried and tested in every area over your years at GDS and have been found worthy of receiving a Greensboro Day School diploma. As you walk across this stage today, prepared to leave the confines of our campus, never forget that you are known, valued, appreciated, and you will never leave our hearts or our fond memories. We will miss you, and we wish you the very best. Congratulations, class of 2000. It's my pleasure to introduce the first of two student speakers to you this morning. I'll begin with Josh Markwell, the president of the senior class. Josh joined the Greensboro Day School community in the spring of his 10th grade year, and it didn't take him long to make an indelible impression on the faculty and his peers. Simply put, Josh is a likable young man. He is friendly, honest, dedicated, disciplined, and is a model of grace and calm when the pressure is on. Despite this calm, quiet demeanor, Josh is not afraid to voice his opinion and challenge his peers' ideas in the classroom. His teachers have been impressed by his methodical approach to the work of being a learner. One upper school faculty member commented that Josh is not always the first to speak up in class, but when he talks, others listen, and his insights often go a long way to increase class understanding. As the president of the senior class, he, Josh has served as the voice of his classmates, representing their concerns, interests, and always promoting the key role the seniors serve as members of the GDS community. The other role that Josh takes very seriously is that of big brother. As Flory, his younger sister, began her freshman year, it was easy to appreciate their close relationship. In so many ways, I think, the role of big brother that he plays so lovingly in the Markwell family has also been his approach to the leadership of his classmates this year. A servant leader, a good friend, an ambitious learner, and this morning, a gifted speaker. It is my privilege to introduce to you Josh Markwell, president of the senior class. Thank you, Dr. Feilman. Now, before I begin, I just want to say, if I pause longer than two seconds, please do me a favor and laugh. Greensboro Day School is not your typical high school. We use laptops, we have an open campus period every day, we take our exams in December and April, we send our juniors into the woods to hike for a week. We allow our seniors to explore for the last four weeks of school, and we have 15 minutes of designated snack time every morning. All these things culminate in a unique and unmatched high school experience by the time every GDS student graduates. However, this is just the surface of what makes GDS so incredible. I have been asked by many people outside the GDS community why I truly like the school so much. However, oh, excuse me. Unfortunately, more often than not, they assume it's because I have enough time to drive off campus every day to eat lunch. I admit that even though this convenience is nice, there is so much more that makes this school special. I transferred to GDS halfway through my sophomore year. Even though I knew a few students through club sports, I was incredibly intimidated by the thought of having all new teachers and classmates. I remember sitting in my room over Christmas break, contemplating whether or not I had made the right decision to transfer. In hindsight, it's not my anxious feelings that I regret. What I regret is not coming to GDS sooner. I can confidently say that not once did I ever feel like the new kid while at GDS. I was immediately embraced and welcomed with open arms. My immediate acceptance into this community could not have been as entertaining let alone possible without the tremendous class that sits before you today. This group of scholars, athletes, thespians, volunteers, and most importantly, friends, 
makes up one of the most accomplished and enjoyable classes to ever graduate from GDS. Their hard work, dedication, patience, and success over the past four years is truly enviable. Being able to engage and learn from this remarkable group of kids the past two and a half years can only be described as a privilege. Class of 2014, if you take one thing away from this speech, know that people will remember the impact you have on them. I know I will. Thank you for a great two and a half years, and remember, always keep it classy. Thank you, Josh. It's also my pleasure to introduce to you the president of the Student Council, Chris Caffrey. For many of us, memories of Chris Caffrey are intertwined with his affection for wearing costumes. Hawaiian shirts, funny hats are the hallmark of his tutorial style, as well as his smooth moves on the dance floor which were in evidence Wednesday night at prom. But for those of us who know Chris well, we are also keenly aware that he is a serious student and a devoted student leader. In the role of student council president, Chris has always been a mature and level-headed representative of the student body and a trustworthy partner with the upper school's administration. He's also a young man who daily strives to walk his talk. Upon returning from a school trip to Nicaragua during his sophomore year, Chris worked diligently to persuade the Bingo Cafe to serve the Nicaraguan coffee he had discovered while on the service trip. Working with the school's food services staff, the business office, and faculty, he was able to forge a partnership with the Sisters Communities of San Ramon, a nonprofit organization to provide the coffee produced by Nicaraguan farmers in our Bingo Cafe. The profits earned from this transaction have assisted the residents of San Ramon region of Nicaragua. This successful venture, though, is only one of the examples of Chris Caffrey's persistent leadership and strong character. So it's my pleasure this morning to introduce to you the president of our student council, Christopher Caffrey. made it. A few moments of time separate us from being high school graduates, an achievement that was made through many years of schooling, quizzes, tests, homework or not doing homework, projects and sleep deprived nights, although I think that last part is because some of us are procrastinators. All those great memories we made through the years will enrich us for the rest of our lives. However, high school graduation is not only about celebrating the past, but looking to the future. This graduation is a stepping stone for the journeys to come over the next few summer months, during college and subsequent years. Listen to your heart, follow your soul, dream big and don't do stupid. Rather than providing you wisdom on ultimate dreams in the distant future or what career path will lead to great financial success and happiness, I will instead concentrate on the coming summer. The summer that lies before us all until the start of college is a time of true boundlessness. You can do whatever you want. Climb a mountain, go scuba diving, discover a new animal species, win the lottery, Go to Alaska and prospect for gold. Be a rodeo clown. Go to a Los Angeles Lakers game, not the Clippers. <laughs> Direct an award-winning film. Make an invention for one of those infomercials. And even, even read a book. Or sit on your couch, enjoying a plate of nachos with extra cheese, watching Step Brothers, 
and contemplating if being a stay-at-home son would actually work. <laughs> That's what I'll be doing. Joking aside, have a great summer and take life one step at a time so as to minimize the risk of tripping. But before I finish up, I must give a brief history lesson that will help you all remember this day for the rest of your lives. Whenever you need to calm down, focus on something important, or prepare for a challenge, reminisce with these transcendent words, Goober Peas, an old Civil War song. <clears throat> When passes, soldiers have a rule. They cry out at their loudest, Mister, where's your mule? But another pleasure more enchanting -er than these is wearing out your grinders, eating goober peas. Peas, 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 eating goober peas. Goodness, how delicious, eating goober peas. Peas, 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 eating goober peas. That's a wrap. Thank you. Members of the Mixed Review will now offer a song for our seniors, The Road Home.
Founders Award is presented each year at graduation to the member of the graduating class who best exemplifies the characteristics of scholarship, sportsmanship, and leadership implicit in the founding of our school. I would like to invite Carol Leslie to the podium to present the Founders Award. school community and I want to congratulate all of our graduates this year's founders award recipient is affectionately referred to as a lifer which means she earned the distinction of having attended Greensboro Day School since kindergarten her fourth grade teacher Mrs. Goodman described her as an old soul. She said, I knew it the minute she walked in my classroom. She just got it. She understood the power of a great education. She understood that sometimes you have to do things you don't want to do, and you don't sweat the, sweat the small stuff. She is a big thinker who is willing to challenge the status quo. She is a role model both her peers and teachers. Her sixth grade PE teacher, Mr. Carty, noted that her ability to lead and to include everyone is amazing. Her eighth grade English teacher, Mrs. Dunbar, commented that our Founders Award recipient is one of the most talented and articulate students she has ever taught. Her enthusiasm is contagious and she contributes to the class regularly, adding value to the educational experience of her classmates. During her upper school career, she has received many academic honors, which include induction into the Cum Laude Society, an outstanding achievement in AP Spanish language, advanced biology, advanced chemistry. And as her teachers, have affirmed, Alexa is so much more than a gifted thinker. The faculty all agree that one of her greatest gifts is her ability to challenge her peers to excel. To that end, she is admired by her peers, not only for her stellar academic performance, but also for her leadership, concern for her community, and an eagerness to take on challenges to create change. Beyond GDS, she has participated in social justice seminars in Washington, D.C., where she learned how to present political issues and lobby congressional staff. In addition, Alexa has been a strong advocate for the homeless in Greensboro. As the community service chair, for her Vinay Prith youth group, she is credited with coordinating several service projects benefiting underserved populations in our community. Last year, she was recognized by her classmates with the GDS Citizenship Award. Alexa Schlein is a humanitarian, a musician, an actress, a leader, an independent, inspiring, happy young woman who we have the distinct pleasure of calling a student and a friend. And this year, she is the Founders Award recipient. Alexa. Thank you so much for honoring me with this incredible award, um, especially to 
the incredible teachers at this school, you have made me the woman that I am today, and I will carry what you have taught me with, for the rest of my life. And also, congratulations to my classmates. I love you guys. Award was established in honor of our school's fourth headmaster and is presented annually at graduation to the faculty member who exemplifies the highest standards of teaching and professionalism. I would like to welcome Beverly Edwards, last year's recipient, to announce this year's Hendricks Award recipient. morning to the friends and families of the class of 2014 and to the administration, faculty, and honored guests. My name is Beverly Edwards and I am here to honor a member of our faculty. Mr. Hale just told all the things about the Hendricks Award that I was going to say. So um, we can start with when Jim Hendricks decided that it was time for him to leave Greensboro Day School, a group of his friends and former GDS parents created this award, um, which is offered to one teacher during graduation. I was the recipient of this award last year, and today I'm pleased to pass it on to a very deserving teacher. This year's recipient had a very diverse professional background before becoming a teacher. This person worked in healthcare, insurance, and in a law firm. As a teacher, this person has worked in a variety of locations and divisions. This faculty member worked in a high school, an elementary school, and was even a kindergarten teacher for one year. This year's recipient worked in both public and private schools before coming to GDS seven years ago. This teacher seems to have found a community of teachers and learners that provides a rich environment for continued growth. This teacher has great rapport with her students and maintains religious, rigorous, excuse me, rigorous standards while helping each student reach their highest potential. Not only did this faculty member play a major role in a student's academic recovery after a long absence from school, but with great love and compassion, was willing to step outside her role as a teacher and become a primary force in this child's life. As one of the people who submitted a nomination said, she is the epitome of excellence in teaching. As a faculty leader, she has earned the respect of her peers she has made a definite difference in the lives of students at GDS. It is with great pleasure and happiness that I present this year's James P. Hendricks Award to Charlie Kelly. Oh, okay. And look, you get stuff. Okay, this is yours. Thank you. <laughs> I get to 
this oh, is yours. Okay. You get to polish it. And this is yours. Wow. <laughs> I think for the first time since I've been here at GDS that I'm truly speechless without something witty to say. Um, thank you all so much for bestowing upon me this honor. And I would be less than honorable if I didn't say that for some reason the camera just happened to catch me in a second. And for those of you who know me and know I'm photophobic, that's kind of funny. But I think I'm a mere reflection of all of the faculty who work here, who strive every day to give our students the best that we can offer, to learn from our students, and to further the education of every child that we teach. And I want to give special thanks to Ed Dickinson, who gave me a lot of latitude when it came to creating my teaching strategies and provided with me with encouragement every step of the way. He always had my back and was always there with words of wisdom and encouragement. And none of what I did could be accomplished without the support of the amazing middle school faculty who was always there with help and support and the kind word and everything else that you could imagine in a teaching community. So thank you all very much. Congratulations, Charlie. Well deserved. Well, where does one start when introducing our graduation speaker? I could read off every accomplishment he has, but I can guarantee you we would not have enough time in the day for that. But let's start with his time at Greensboro Day School. He was a member of the National Honor Society, the Math Club, was student body vice president. He co-wrote the school's honor code and went on to graduate from GDS as a National Merit Scholar and was named a Moorhead Scholar at Carolina in 1984. I don't know if he has singing ability, <laughs> but we'll find out. <laughs> Following his graduation with distinction from UNC, he received his MD with honors and distinction in 1993. From UNC, he went on to become a medical resident at Massachusetts General Hospital, an instructor at Harvard Medical School, a physician at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, a professor at the UNC Chapel Hill School of Medicine, and now he serves as the director of the Leinberger Comprehensive Cancer Center. Dr. Sharpless has authored more than 100 research papers and is an inventor who holds 10 patents. He is on the Scientific Advisory Board of several scientific research foundations, is an associate editor of Aging Cell, and is the deputy editor of the Journal of Clinical Investigation. He was the 2007 recipient of the Jefferson Pilot Award, the 2009 recipient of the Hettleman Prize for Scholarly Achievement, a 2010 recipient of the Glenn Award for Research in Biological Mechanisms of Aging, a 2011 recipient of the Greensboro Day School Distinguished Alumni Award, and a 2012 Triangle Business Journal Healthcare Hero, and is a member of the American Society of Clinical Investigation the nation's oldest honor society for physician scientists. It is clear that Ned embodies what it means when our mission statement calls on our school to develop the intellectual, ethical, and interpersonal foundations our students need in order to become constructive contributors to the world. 30 years after he walked across this stage himself, it gives me great pleasure to welcome back today's graduation speaker, a very distinguished alumni, Dr. Ned Sharpless.
<clears throat> I, was, I was listening to that introduction and it made sense until that last part about it being 30 years ago. <laughs> There's no way that can be true. Um, wow, I had no idea how emotional it would make me to come back here and see so many old friends and see the buildings that are different and new but are also somewhat familiar and the same. And um, you know, it's just a, a really wonderful set of memories. We did not have 15 minutes of snack time when I was here. <laughs> I don't believe that. Uh, in any event, students, faculty, staff, parents, and family, it's my pleasure to be asked to return to my alma mater to give today's commencement address. As a cancer center director and a scientist, I actually have the opportunity to do a lot of public speaking. And I've, I've sort of built, boiled my experience down to three simple rules of a good public address, which I will share with you now. And they are one, start with the most important thing, two, don't be boring, and three, and most importantly, keep it short. So against that backdrop, let me offer some remarks. So first, starting with the most important thing, class of 2014, today is your day. Completing high school education, especially a rigorous one, is not a mean feat, and it, you should be very proud of these accomplishments. Graduation from high school is a big day. You may have other big days in your lives. I graduated from med school, I got married, I had kids. Those are big days too, but high school graduation is a big day because it's kind of the first big day. It's that day where you stop being a kid and begin to start being to be an adult. And so it's memorable the rest of your lives. And it's not easy to have done it. So congratulations. I want everyone to join me in doing the most important thing first, which is to congratulate the class of 2014. Now let's move on to rule two, which is to try to not be boring. And in an effort to do that, I will skip the sort of typical commencement fair, which I think is familiar to most people, and tell you the actual three things that you wouldn't usually hear at a commencement, but I wish someone had told me when I was graduating from high school. And these are things that I learned as a physician and as a parent and as a scientist. So basically, I'll sum it up, I'll cut to the chase. There's some bad news, some good news, and just a piece of advice at the end. So the bad news, let's start with that. I am an oncologist, after all. Uh, I, 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 I uh, you know, people ask me, this is something I learned as a physician, you know, people ask me, what was it like becoming a cancer doctor and how do you do that? And it's so difficult to care with patients with cancer because so many of them do so poorly. And I explained to them, I have a little story I like to tell, which is that um, before I was married, I actually lived with my future wife for a year in sin, as my Baptist grandmother would have said. Hey, don't judge, I was in Boston at the time and rent was like more expensive than, uh, you know, a car per month or something. So, so it, was, it was mostly a rent control measure, but in any event, <laughs> in any event, we lived together for a while and I thought I knew what marriage was about before I was married. And similarly, before I was an oncologist, I was actually an internist, which is a general doctor, and I'd taken care of lots of cancer patients. And so I had done a lot of, ca you know, cancer care and I thought I knew what being an oncologist was about. So before I was married, I thought I knew what marriage was like. And before I was an oncologist, I thought I knew what oncology was like. And in both cases, I was wrong. <laughs> so to live with someone, you have to like them, right? You have to get along. And, uh, but to stay married to someone, you have to really, really love them. And uh, foibles and all, that's, that's quite different. Uh, and you know, I, I can remember these early fights during our marriage and you know, after we'd sort of committed to, during the first year when my wife would look at me as I was eating breakfast and she'd say, are you gonna make that noise with the spoon for the rest of our lives? And uh, you know, we, we, we matured as a couple and we worked these things out and you know, and, and eventually we worked into a very happy commitment and it'll be 19 years this September. But, um, oh by the way, there's a part of the story that's immensely fun to a geneticist, which is now my teenage daughter looks at me at the breakfast table and says, with exactly the same expression, in exactly the same tone, are you gonna make that noise with your spoon the rest of our life? <laughs> My wife just sits there and smiles. She thinks that's hilarious. So uh, in any event, that's what it was like when I started oncology. I, I knew that oncology was fascinating and I knew that taking cancer, care of cancer patients would be rewarding and in many ways inspiring, but I, I, there were other things about it I didn't know. So when people come to their oncologist, they, they, they generally, you know, they have cancer and they stop pretending and they drop all pretense and they, they come very scared and they're, they're, they, they often are thinking they're gonna die and, and really often they're right about that. And so your job as an oncologist is sort of help them in these incredibly difficult situations. And 
what I've been, it's inspiring in some ways, the, the power, the, um, the dignity that people, you know, get through these awful situations. And in my life, not once but twice, I've been invited to weddings in the hospital of my patients who had, you know, weeks or months to live, who got married uh, as their final act. And it's just so, ins so unbelievably touching to, to see that love and commitment. And I can tell you that that gesture has a power to heal that no bottle of chemotherapy can come close to. So, you know, it's inspiring to be an oncologist, but there's also a bad thing. And the thing that I didn't know when I started oncology that became imminent, you know, quite clear to me very quick, quickly was that of the sort of first 30 patients I started taking care of when I was an oncologist in that first year, basically all died within the year I knew them. And these were people that were very dear to me. They were friends and, uh, you know, I, I was very attached to them. And it was hard to have that happen over and over and over. And it uh, made me realize that uh, many of those patients were younger than I am today. So it made me realize that bad stuff can happen, and it can happen to you at virtually no notice. So as an oncologist, I've learned that we should live every day as if tomorrow we could get run over by a bus. Now, please don't misunderstand me. This is not a call for hedonism. This is not, you know, carpe diem, and YOLO, as my kids say. <laughs> <clears throat> Exactly the opposite. It means plan accordingly. It means have good health insurance, for God's sakes. It means <laughs> stay on good terms with your loved ones because they can disappear suddenly and then you, you know, you'll feel bad if you, you left them in that, in that state. You know, uh, back up your data to the cloud. Good tip. <laughs> but, but most of all, live life virtuously so that if you are soon sick and you're stuck in your deathbed, you can lie there without bitterness and regret. My son and I often have a relevant debate here that I'll, I'll, I'll relate to you. I think it will probably sound familiar to some of you. I'll tell him to study math. And he'll say, you know, in that great teenage wisdom way, you know, Dad, 20 years from now, I won't remember what I got on my algebra test. You know, I should go have fun with my friends. You know, this, this is sort of this, the pure sophistry of puberty. Uh, but first of all, a couple things about that. First, I dispute the premise because I, in fact, do remember what I got on my algebra test 20 years ago. <laughs> Some of you don't believe me, but Kathy Davis knows. <laughs> so second, he's probably right, actually. I think he has a good point that these tests, these arbitrary milestones of SATs and things, they don't matter in the grand scheme, but neither does the hedonistic activities that he has in mind. I mean, I may not recall what I got on my test 20 years ago, but I also don't recall how many beers I drank at the Coyote Mixer my freshman year although I think it was probably several. Uh, so activities done solely for immediate gratification don't stick in the memory. They're just stuff that happens to you. They're neither good nor bad. But the reason you should work hard and really acquire mastery is not because of the tests, but to get good at something so that you can do something meaningful and gratifying. So the memorable stuff, the really good stuff that you'll happily recollect later on in bad times are the things that takes effort to, to accomplish and things that which you're proud of doing. So to summarize what I've learned as an oncologist, it's that bad things happen suddenly in some instances. So plan accordingly. Now, so here's the good news. What I've learned as a parent that's helped, that's helped me deal with this sort of aforementioned bad news is that uh, you know, there, there are things about life that are really, really wonderful. So the, the first part of that's a, a bummer, right? I mean, if, if you could get run over by a bus tomorrow and it's a, it's a very sort of negative message for a commencement speech, you know, why even get out of med in, the, med in the morning? But my answer for me has been found in the happiness of my family. And by family, I don't mean, you know, sort of some arbitrary legal distinction or sharing of DNA, <clears throat> but really, um, uh, you know, that close circle of friends and the, of people that love you and, and they care about you and about whom you love and, and care about as well. And I'll tell you, I have been very lucky in my life, and I've had a lot of really good things happen. I've gotten to take care of these wonderful patients that have really taught me so much about the, the dignity of humanity. I, I've made discoveries in the lab that I get to go on, like NBC and Time Magazine and stuff like that to talk about. I founded these companies that are making drugs that I think are really going to help cancer patients. And I have this great job now running the Cancer Center, where, where I work with these inspiring and unbelievably talented scientists. And that's been really, really wonderful. But I have to say, none of those things have made me as personally satisfied as the uh, happiness I've found within my family. And I'll tell you one story, and I think it's, it's, it's sort of, it's, it's, it's illustrative in its, its smallness, its, its sort of uh, easiness, and it's, so, its familiarity, which is, you know, once when I was uh, back when we were living in Boston, I returned home from a long trip uh, where I'd been away and it was exhausting, and I came home to this dark, quiet house, and I assumed my wife and kids were asleep, and 
You know, as one often does when they return home for a long trip, I was standing at the kitchen table going through that pile of mail that's accumulated and it's all bills and junk and stuff I don't want to deal with. And I'm just sort of thinking, what, there's got to be more to this. This is a really unpleasant way to live your life. And while I'm doing this, this sort of creature about this tall in footy pajamas sneaks up on me and hugs me around my shins, basically, because that's about how, she could, how high she could reach when she was three, and says, Daddy. And that was about the only word she knew back then. And it made me feel so welcome and great to be home. And, and I pick her up, and it's like 1130 at night, way past her bedtime, and we're making all this noise. And I'm like, did you miss me? Did you miss me? And then her, her brother, her older brother, hears her. He comes down, and we're having this little family party. And then my wife comes down, and she has that look on her face like, oh, God. It took me an hour to get them to sleep. And <laughs> now you want to play with them. But in any event, this sort of stealth hug turned into this happy memory that here I am talking about 12 years later. So you know, that was no electronics. It wasn't expensive. There was nothing sort of special about that other than that it was like the best thing that happened to me that year. So mere moments like that can keep one afloat for a boring job or a, 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 a dismal sort of circumstance for years. So this is the good news, that family and friends make it all worth it. And that's great because family and friends, as you see here, are available to almost all of us. I mean, we have this community. We live in this great country that allows us to build these communities through pursuit of happiness. And that way, we have our loved ones around. So what I've learned as a parent is that family makes up for part one, i.e., the bad stuff that your mortality is fleeting. So, uh, and here's the last part I will say, and this is just a piece of advice. And this is what I've learned as a scientist. Take some chances. So in science, hard work is important, and being smart is a nice thing to be, and having like, people skills is good. But really, the main thing that scientists value is creativity. It's originality. It's having a thought that no one else ever had. And that's not just true in science, but I think creativity is valued in sort of all walks of life, lawyers, uh, other professional careers, but also in non-professional life. It's, it's good to have friends who are interesting and fun and amusing. So I, I think creativity is underrated, and it's really important. But it's not enough just to have kind of crazy ideas. You actually, at some point, to really make them mean anything, have to act upon them. So that means you have to take chances and have crazy actions. And this is a somewhat familiar notion in literature. So I think uh, you know many of you know this Robert Frost poem about two roads diverging in the wood. And there's this road that like everybody takes. And he takes this other road that's less traveled. And that has made all the difference. That's a famous story. And then there's you know, Lewis Carroll talking about this girl at a, you know, this boring tea party. And she follows this white rabbit down a bunny hole. And you know, that in, in, ends up having a very interesting set of experiments. And then there's this movie some of you may have seen, you know, The Matrix, where there's this, uh, there's this guy. And he has this boring job. And he meets this other guy. And, and the guy says, you can take this pill and go back to your crummy day job, or you can take this pill, and we'll see what happens. And uh, he takes that pill, and, and mischief ensues. And, but see, here's the thing. In the movies, it's really easy to tell You know, the, 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 the Morpheus character, the guy who's giving you that advice. He's like tall, and he's cool looking, and he's bald, and he's got sunglasses and a leather trench coat. But in real life, figuring out the crazy idea that's a good crazy idea is a lot harder. If you take the road less traveled, in my experience, you end up just usually getting lost. And if you chase ra rabbits down holes, you find copperheads in North Carolina. So, uh, and as, as, as the handsome, beautiful young people that you are, you're going to have a lot of terrible advice in the next few years. So I think it's, it's easy to say, you know, there'll be that continental European swarthy looking guy who'll say, run off with me to Spain and let's have a life adventure and quit school. And, you know, maybe that guy just wants someone to do his laundry. <laughs> And, and, and maybe you'll have that college roommate, and he'll say, like, dude, let's quit college and go move to Colorado and start a hydroponic marijuana farm. And that, that's probably a bad idea, I'm going to tell you. So these aren't good ideas. They're, 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 they're crazy, yeah, but they're not crazy good ideas. So a real, like, Alice in Wonderland good idea, that rabbit hole opportunity, comes about, but very rarely. So vigilantly look for these crazy ideas and take them when you find them but be very, very circumspect in the process. Learn the difference between being audaciously creative, good, and impulsively foolish, bad. Uh, and no one can really help you figure this out. That's the hard part. By definition, a crazy idea sounds crazy, right? So if you go to your parents and your friends and say, hey, I want to do this crazy thing, they're going to say, don't do that. That's crazy. And you're the one who has to figure it out. You have to vet these things and, and tell the wheat from the chaff, so to speak. And that's very, very scary, actually, when you get at some stage in your career. But it's also truly exhilarating. 
So that's the final piece of advice. Try something crazy, take risks, but be smart about it because bad ideas way outnumber the good. So in closing, now in order to make rule three, which is keep it short, I'm gonna wrap up. But so I'll summarize by saying as a doctor, I've learned to live life virtuously because tomorrow I could get run over by a bus. As a parent, I've learned to live with the fact that, that awful fact of our mortality by understanding that life holds some really wonderful things. In my case, the most important of which center around family. And as a scientist, I've learned to take some risks. They're scary, but in the end, they can turn out to be worth it. And now to close the same way that I opened with the most important thing, which is class of 2014, this is your day. You did it. Celebrate what will likely be the first of many big days for you. Congratulations, new graduates. I think in our family, we've experienced all those bad, crazy ideas. <laughs> Each year, it is a great pleasure to present the Distinguished Alumni Award. And this year, I would like to invite Greer Booker Richards, class of 97, and president of our Alumni Association to make that award. The Greensboro Day School Alumni Association in recognition of excellence on the part of our alumni, established the Distinguished Alumni Award in 1991. This award is presented annually to the alumnus or alumna who best exhibits at least one of the following qualities. Extraordinary service to the city of Greensboro, the state of North Carolina, or the nation, and extraordinary distinction in one's field of spe specialization or extraordinary service to society and corresponding tangible benefits to fellow citizens. Well, this year's award recipient, quite frankly, knocks these qualifications out of the park. Where do we start? Fundraiser, internal consultant, award-winning producer, Founder, manager. This year's award recipient was recognized by the former Lincoln Center president as being, quote, one of a very few people who understands all aspects of the arts. She joined Lincoln Center in 2007 and served as director of strategy and business development charged with developing new entrepreneurial ventures for the world's largest performing arts center as it approached its 50th anniversary. She was asked to lead the institution's Bravo campaign, an ambitious fundraising initiative charged with supporting a $1.2 billion physical transformation of the Lincoln Center campus, which was the largest active construction project in Manhattan after the World Trade Center site. When she moved to New York in 2000, our recipient worked for theater producers and general managers and helped to build and launch Ars Nova, a hub for emerging talent in theater, comedy, and music in New York. In 2003, she received a Tony Award for the best revival of a play as a producer of Long Day's Journey into the Night. She is a summa cum laude graduate of Duke University and received her MBA from Harvard Business School in 2007. Currently, our recipient serves as the Managing Director of Lincoln Center Global, an international consulting practice which she founded with Lincoln Center's president in 2012. This group advises governments, philanthropists, corporations, and universities around the world in planning, building, and operating vibrant arts facilities and cultural districts. She serves on the advisory committee of the American Theater Wing and the Tony Administration Committee. Just a few months ago, she was selected by Crane's New York Business Magazine for the 2014 class of 40 under 40. 
When not doing any of these fabulous and amazing things, she enjoys spending time with her husband, Dove, and their children, Riley and Audrey. Please help me now in recognizing this year's Distinguished Alumni Award recipient and my good friend, Kara Medoff Barnett, Class of 1996. Thank you, Greer, and thank you to my fellow alumni for this incredible honor. I am thrilled to be back here on this stage, but I must admit I had to fight the urge to put on a white dress and buy a yellow rose on my way here. Anyway, I don't know about distinguished, which sounds a little formal, but I, I do feel incredibly honored and incredibly grateful. I'm grateful for my parents and grandparents who are over there and who chose to send me to this school. And they supported me academically, emotionally, and financially over my 10 years here. I'm grateful for my teachers, many of whom I see here, who patiently read my papers that always exceeded the suggested word count. And uh, just as an aside, last week I heard this incredible presentation from a, a renowned psychologist on grit. And I think that I learned to be gritty in Mrs. Morris's algebra and calculus classes because there was just no way that you were getting out of that room until you understood that proof and had worked your way through it. I'm grateful for my five GDS alumni siblings, Ari, Sar, Mika, Carmi, and Jenna, <coughs> who uh, put me in my place whenever I receive anything resembling an award. And I'm expecting a good deal of humi humiliation at some point over the weekend. I'm grateful for my GDS friends, as my best friend today is my best friend from Mrs. Dunker's third grade class, and a group of GDS girls from my 96 graduating class are in touch regularly. We share photos, news, birthday wishes, and embarrassing stories at least once a week. And I'm grateful for the GDS alumni community, which has provided me with the best babysitters in New York City. Unexpected ski buddies in Colorado, I've literally run into GDS alumni on the slopes, and even a dinner date in Shanghai last month with someone who I didn't even know at GDS. She was a senior when I was a freshman, but we connected. So I know you've heard a lot of advice this morning, and you'll probably hear more from your families over lunch and as you get ready to go on to college, but here are a few things that perhaps you haven't yet heard. So number one, Get out of town. See the world. Buy a bus ticket or a plane ticket. Stay in hotels or hostels. Go solo or go with groups, but get out of here. You'll be amazed and shocked and inspired and sometimes lost if your sense of direction is as bad as mine. <clears throat> but all of this will make you a more interesting and resilient person. Number two is come home often. Greensboro is a very special place. Come back to see your folks and your friends and to get hush puppies at cookout. I have not found any decent hush puppies in New York or in Abu Dhabi or in Beijing or Tokyo. They just don't exist. Come back here. <laughs> Write handwritten notes. Seriously, like on stationery with a pen. You will surprise and delight and sometimes shock your friends, your colleagues, your bosses, your interviewers. That's a tip. I promise they will take notice. Make your professional choices based on people. If you go for brand names or fancy titles or big salaries, you may very well find yourself uninspired and unhappy. But if you work with people you admire, you are guaranteed to learn and grow every day. Number five, and I promise there are only six of these, it's okay to change your mind. We heard about crazy, crazy ideas a little bit earlier. And I personally don't believe in 10-year plans or five-year plans. Don't be afraid to try something and give it your all and then change directions. When I sat in your seats, I was pretty sure I was going to be a doctor. Uh, the dots will eventually connect. Number six, 
call up those people from GDS wherever you go on this planet. Even if you weren't in the same class, even if your graduations were separated by a decade or more, GDS alumni will be delighted to hear from you. And they may just offer you an internship, or a job, or a place to stay, or a free meal. I am honored to welcome all of you, the very distinguished class of 2014, into the GDS alumni family. And I am excited for all of the spectacular adventures that lie ahead for each and every one of you. I hope you enjoy them. Before introducing my favorite class of 2014 and confirming that they've met all our requirements for graduation, I want to offer an apology. I am so aware of what a privilege it is to be a member of this community and that being a part of GDS means that we all come each and every day committed to doing our best. But sometimes we fall short of the mark. It came to my attention yesterday afternoon at convocation that we failed to recognize some of our students who had received significant merit scholarships in our program. At the risk of naming names and realizing that I have yet again left a name off of the list, I want you to please know that in our alumni magazine, the list will be corrected. But I also want my seniors to know that you are exquisite, that each and everything you've accomplished from learning how to write your name to learning how to exceed the word count, learning how to be members of a class that support one another, who care about one another, and who can give one another advice about virtue and kindness and compassion far exceed any, any dollar amount. I could not be more proud of you and appreciative of the way that you've enriched not only my life, but the lives of your teachers, your classmates, your families in this community. So, Mrs. Tewksbury and Mr. Hale, it is my pleasure to confirm for you this morning that each member of our class of 2014 who is sitting on stage with us today has met the requirements established by our school, the Greensboro Day School, for graduation and is so qualified to receive a diploma this morning. The hardest thing they now have to do is to stand in unison. So please rise. Just the first row, I knew it there. I told you all it was going to be a challenge. But look how well they did. Alexandra Grace Ackerman. Tyler Michael Alusio. <laughs> Julia Renee Anderson. That was actually Renee Julia Anderson for those who were listening and noticed my mistake. William Ryan Armstrong. Amani Monisha Simone Atkinson. Miranda Albany Bachicha.
Carson Shaw Bankhead. Lauren Elise Bean. Haley Victoria Biggs. Emily Walker Bohr. Jordan Allen Klinger. Claire Elizabeth Burns. Christopher Price Caffrey. Kevin Matthew Cardi. Jackson Maiden Clark. Colin Samuel Clark. Julia Anna Cook. Connor Monroe Cook. Noah Lowell Corbett. Natalie Ann Curry. Gina Jeanette Dick. Marilyn Mandeldick. Elizabeth Mary Doherty. Quentin McKinley Doubt. Edward Russell Gaines the Fourth. Matthew Thomas Gassioric. Mary Hugh Yang Glazer. Elizabeth Catherine Hainel. <laughs> Caroline Ong Spur. Alec Joseph Haggerty. <laughs> Haley Thompson Harrell. <laughs> Clayton Richard Hawkins. Rachel Suzanne Hayes.
Patricia Eugenie Hazlitt. Myra Alma Reen Renee Henderson. John Richard Hudgens. John Woods Jennings. Ashley Wentworth Kesselring. Amina Ali Khan. <laughs> Jamie Alexandra Klikowski. <laughs> Haley Elizabeth Klinger. Olivia Parker Knox. <laughs> Louis Alexander Kunar. <laughs> Maxim Alexandrovich Kurgan. Sarah Lindsay Liebkeman. <laughs> Matthew Charles Lowe. <laughs> Rachel Erin Luce. Marshall Ford Macalette. Connor Michael Mansfield. Joshua Daniel Marquell. Laura Evans McGee. <laughs> Catherine Kelly McGinley. <laughs> Matthew Augustus McIver. <laughs> Brandy Maria McLean. Matthew Robert Mellum. James Hornaday Murray, Jr. Nicholas Gregory Nelson. Justin Lane Pegram. <laughs> or not. Pardon me. Catherine Ann Ognovich. <laughs> now, Justin Lane Pegram. Emily Lawrence Perkins. <laughs> Mary, 
Matthew Alexander Petronitz. Richard Samuel Pulitzer. William Walker Rowe. Carol Edwards Roman. Eric Todd Rosenbauer. <laughs> Brian Andrew Rouse. <laughs> Tyler Chase Rowland. Mary Catherine Sapp. <laughs> Jance Thomas Skirmerhorn. <laughs> Robert Layton Fish Schiffman. Alexa Pearl Schlein. <laughs> Caroline Gail Schlosser. <laughs> Zachary Tomasz Schneer. Rachel James Scump. <laughs> Shivani Ashish Shah. <laughs> April Caroline Shaw. Caroline Blair Sherwood. <laughs> Joshua Samuel Sire. <laughs> Catherine Elizabeth Sipes. Lauren Michelle Smur. <laughs> Ethan Thomas Smith. <laughs> Reed Walter Smith. Teresa Claire Stark. <laughs> David Aaron Stern. <laughs> Megan Nicole Stonecipher. Tyler Craig Sudbrink. <laughs> Kelsey Ann Seppel.
William Clayton Swords. Nikolos Kirikov Teresidis. Zachary Holden Tate. Christian Draper Taylor. Grayson Alexander Thompson. Pierce Michael Vesey. Raj Druvias. Angelica Faith Warren. Joseph Max, Maxwell Weingold. James Franklin Weston III. Grace Larson Williams. Catherine Melinda Wright. <laughs> Micah Miramiri Zimmerman. Once more, let me present to you the class of 2014. Please stand and join us in the singing of our alma mater.
May we be thankful for health and strength, for sun and rain and peace. Let us seize the day and the opportunity and strive for that greatness of spirit that measures life not by its disappointments, but by its possibilities. Please joining, uh, join us after this in the alumni gym to congratulate our graduates.